started. Hello, everybody. This is the International Space Science Institute's Game Changers seminar series, where we look at missions that change the game in the space sciences. And I am Tillman, and I'm again your host here at the EC in Bern, Switzerland. Actually, I'm in Berlin, but, you know, virtually I'm in Bern. Today is already the ninth uh, Game Changers seminar, and after looking at the sun last Thursday, we're back with a planetary exploration talk. We will follow the Dawn mission to Vesta and Cirrus, a protoplanet and a dwarf planet in the asteroid belt. And I'm sure that Carol will tell us more about proto and dwarf planets uh, uh, today in her talk. Today's seminar will actually be the last one on planetary exploration for this year. We will turn to the near Earth magnetic field coming Thursday with Rumi Nakamura and back to the sun thereafter in November and December. We will be having seven talks on game change emissions in astronomy and astrophysics. Today's speaker, however, is Carol Raymond, principal scientist at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California, which has been building and flying so many NASA, successful NASA missions, including Dawn and including uh, inside, you know, the mission that I am involved in. <clears throat> you cannot be more qualified uh, speaking about Don than Carol, who after being deputy PI of the mission succeeded Chris Russell as uh, PI during the extended mission. Without further ado, Carol, thank you very much for uh, joining us today, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Tom. Um, very excited to be here talking to you all virtually uh, about the Don mission. Um, it's been a fantastic ride for all involved, and uh, I'd love to share the highlights um, with the general public and especially with my scientific colleagues. So I just want to uh, get going here, and, and um, my title slide here shows you the, the two objects I'll be talking about, Vesta and Ceres, as they were known before Dawn arrived. And what we're going to hear about is how the mission turned them into well-known small worlds and all of the fantastic things that we learned about them and what it means in general for space science. So let's get started. So at the dawn of the solar system, the nebula was rich in radioactive heat sources, mainly aluminum 26. And that was a very um, rapidly decaying uh, source. So it would heat the interiors of bodies that formed very early and that uh, heat drove uh, evolutionary processes. So we, we were, with the Dawn mission, we were seeking to answer some fundamental questions about the earliest epoch of the solar system. Um, what were the chemical variations in the nebular disk? Um, how did the formation time affect the outcome? And then what processes mixed material after the planetesimals formed? And these answers pertain to big questions like how unique is our water rich planet? Uh, where did it get its water? And where and when were conditions for life met during solar system history? And this, is, this um, illustration is meant to reinforce the idea that uh, we're looking at the fingerprints of the disk chemistry in the bodies that were uh, forming from the protosolar nebula and then uh, the, the current distribution of the planetesimals with those fingerprints records events which scattered these small bodies as, as the planets were forming. So essentially small bodies provides um, some forensic evidence towards what the um, early solar nebula um, conditions were. And that was really the motivation for the Dawn mission. Uh, we visit two survivors from the earliest epoch of the solar system. And to, we, we do that to answer fundamental questions about protoplanet formation and evolution, specifically the role of size and accretion time in the differentiation and in their interior evolution. We, we also um, want to understand the role of the initial composition and the, therefore the accretionary environment. And then the effects of um, evolutionary processes like impacts. So uh, a little bit of a tour of the mission. We launched in 2007. I don't know if you can see my cursor here um, from the Earth. We did a, we were using uh, ion propulsion to thrust. We passed uh, Mars for a gravity assist, which allowed us to change our plane um, and meet the uh, orbit of Vesta. We thrusted um, for uh, 
three and a half years, arriving at Vesta in July of 2011, and then went into orbit around Vesta for 14 months. Uh, did a very comprehensive evaluation. We left in September of 2012, and then um, kept pushing out towards the orbit of Ceres. And we caught up with Ceres in March of 2015. And then we remained there until we ran out of fuel in October of 2018. Um, so we have a really, really detailed examination of both of these bodies. So in addition to answering those big questions, uh, we also had the thrill of exploring new worlds. And I, I can't emphasize enough what a thrill it was because these bodies were just fantastic new worlds. Um, and this, this uh, image here is showing the Snowman Crater series on Vesta. Marcia Crater is, is at the top of this figure and you can see the fantastic uh, geomorphology of this crater system, all of the different types of materials um, that are in the crater and in the ejecta. Um, and on the right side is Halani Crater on Ceres, uh, another just um, incredibly interesting crater with uh, many different landforms, many different types of materials um, that, that give us insights about what's going on in the interior of these bodies. So with um, the data that we've collected, we're able to study the geology, geochemistry, geophysics, uh, the impact fluxes onto these bodies and the processes that en ensue, links to meteorites, differentiation history, the separation of, of the materials within the body, and also um, how, met, how much and what the nature is of the volatiles that were delivered to these bodies and to other objects in the solar system. So importantly, Ceres and Vesta, the targets of the Dawn mission, make up 45% of the mass of the entire main asteroid belt. So that's, these, these really are um, very significant objects. And as I started with, they are uh, leftovers from the very earliest epoch of the solar system. Um, most of the mass of the asteroid belt is made up of much smaller objects, which don't uh, necessarily retain the characteristics of that early epoch. So to put it in size context, here is Vesta um, <clears throat> compared to all of the other asteroids that have been visited by space missions. And I'll just point out at the bottom here, Itakawa, Bennu, and Ryugu, um, which are um, ones that, that we're quite familiar with, with recent missions, OSIRIS-REx, Hayabusa, Hayabusa-2, um, really don't show up at this scale. Vesta is, is a protoplanet, Ceres is a dwarf planet. The definition of a protoplanet is a, a large planetesimal, which was undergoing planetary processes on its way to um, becoming a planetary embryo. Ceres, a dwarf planet, is one that is uh, large enough to, uh, con that its gravity is controlling its shape, and it's um, of a certain size that is, you know, more than uh, a protoplanet. So where did they live? Uh, the main asteroid belt is between Mars and Jupiter. And uh, you can see on the uh, right side, a, a basically a cross section through the main asteroid belt where the histogram shows you the number of objects uh, versus distance from the sun on the, uh, the x-axis. Vesta is, is really kind of in the inner part of the main belt where the objects are generally drier. Ceres lives uh, more in the outer part of the belt where you encounter many more uh, volatile rich objects, including at the very edges of the main belt, um, so-called main belt comets. So before the, the Dawn mission, we already knew quite a bit about Vesta because uh, many, many meteorites have arrived on the earth from Vesta. About uh, five or 6% of the meteorite falls on the earth uh, come from Vesta. And, and it's, it's a, a fact, a, a situation where Vesta is close to a resonance of the Jupiter gravity field, which was causing those, um, those notches that you saw in the histogram on the previous slide. And because Vesta uh, material was excavated from Vesta and, and was uh, traveling with it in its orbit in a family of objects, some of those objects uh, were drifting uh, under the uh, solar radiation forces and, and other perturbations into these resonances of, of the Jupiter gravity field, which um, flung them on Earth-crossing orbits. 
So we just have this treasure trove of um, material that came from Vesta. Um, the so-called Howardite, Eucrite, Diogenite series meteorites shown here in, um, in uh, microscopic images. The Eucrites are like basalts on earth, like uh, you know, mid-ocean basalts. Uh, the cumulate Eucrites are ones that cooled more slowly at depth. Um, Diogenite uh, is more of a, um, a, more like a gabbro or a mantle, uh, more of a mantle type rock. And Howardite is a, a ground up brecciated mixture of Eucrite and Diogenite. And we, um, these are the main uh, types of materials that we uh, have in the meteorite collection that have been associated with Vesta. How do we know uh, that the Vesta might be the parent of these materials? Because the reflectance spectrum shown on the right at the top of Vesta itself seen through telescopes from the earth shows these two deep absorption bands at around one micron and two microns wavelength. And those are due to pyroxenes, a uh, certain type of mineral in these, um, in these materials uh, uh, shown on the left. And so the laboratory spectra of these eucrites and diogenites um, show a clear match to uh, the Vesta spectrum. So it was posited that Vesta was the parent body of all of the HEDs, which all showed um, affinity to each other. And that um, Vesta is probably the only solitary object which has been associated with a clan of meteorites. And so uh, given that, uh, going to Vesta is like essentially a, a reverse sample return mission. We have the samples, we want to go find out what the object is like. So we went there with a payload that uh, was quite simple, but quite effective. Uh, we had dual framing cameras from DLR and Max Planck. We had a gamma ray neutron detector from Los Alamos uh, Labs and the Planetary Science Institute, and a visible and infrared mapping spectrometer from OSI and uh, the Italian Institute for Space Astrophysics and Planetology. We also used um, the coherent Doppler tracking of the spacecraft from the deep space network to derive the gravity fields of both of the objects. And we use the images to create uh, very detailed topographic models by obtaining uh, lots of multi, uh, uh, lots of different views of the surface at, um, at multiple angles. And that resulted in our, um, uh, the, these two, visions of these two worlds um, that we determined from the, the image data. And on the, on the left side, you see Vesta. These two objects are now presented uh, to scale. And you can see that Vesta is quite lumpy and has a uh, high topography. It's got more than 40 kilometers of relief on its uh, surface. Its average diameter at 530 is about a half of the average diameter of, of Ceres at 940. Um, but Vesta is much denser. It's much closer to a, a basaltic rock density, whereas Ceres is clearly um, contains much more water. Um, I'll also want you to note how much rounder Ceres is. And that um, is the, the fact is that it's uh, has a nearly hydrostatic figure because of the amount of um, water that's still incorporated into the body. Uh, one other point I'll make here is that you notice that uh, Ceres does have uh, this high standing topography in the red. And you can also see that it has some, some fairly deep basins in the green and blue. So it does show some relief on its surface. Um, but as I said, much less than you see with Vesta. So uh, let's look at what Don learned at each body, and then we'll go into some detail. So we knew a lot, of, a lot about Vesta from study of the HED meteorites, as I mentioned before. And so what Don confirmed is that Vesta is volatile core. Uh, it has fully differentiated. It melted in, in, in its interior. The iron and, and heavy material went to the core. And then the, the liquids uh, formed basalt uh, crust on the surface, near the surface. And in, in between, um, we assume there's an olive mantle. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, we also confirmed that Vesta is the HED parent body. And that was incredibly important 
because now we can um, we can look at the the HED meteorites and and knowing that they they do uh, represent Vesta um, that that gives us a, um, a a really powerful data set to understand Vesta's evolution. Um, what we learned by going to Vesta was that it also formed a volatile depleted material. That its magmatic evolution was complex, not quite the sort of you know classical layer cake um, melting and and um, separation and the core mantle crust in all of the uh, types of um, of rocks that we would expect. And we also learned that Vesta created a volatile rich material that was delivered by impacts. And while um, that was apparent from the meteorites, it wasn't clear how much material there was or what its fate was once it reached Vesta. And we'll be talking about these, um, these aspects as the talk proceeds. So we also confirmed that Ceres is volatile rich. We knew that from telescopic observations of its shape and we knew something about its density. So uh, we could infer that it was volatile rich and that it was partially differentiated. And here the word differentiated, um, which just means you know, separated into parts. But in this case, the differentiation is between ice and rock. So um, the, the ice and the, um, the silicate uh, grains are um, mixed up into a, uh, a mixture, uh, you know, more uh, intimately mixed when the body forms out of the nebular material. But um, since the body's large and there was enough aluminum 26 to heat the interior, the ice um, melted. And so we, we ended up uh, separating the, the, the water and the rock components. And we'll hear about that. And um, as, a, as a consequence of that, we confirmed that Ceres did experience global aqueous alteration, which was predicted based on the amount of volatile material and the size of the body. And these words just mean that the water interacted with the rock and created um, uh, water-rich minerals um, and basically clays. We also learned, um, which was somewhat surprising, not entirely because telescopes had told us that there appeared to be some um, so, some carbonates and um, perhaps ammonia rich species on Ceres, but we did learn that Ceres is nitrogen rich. And it's similar to, but not a match to, an altered uh, carbonaceous chondrite called a CI. Um, very surprising was the fact that um, it has ongoing brine driven geologic activity. Before we, when the Dawn mission was on its way to Ceres, um, I used to refer to Ceres as a fossil from the early days of the solar system. And what we learned is it's not a fossil, it's very much a living, breathing uh, body. Um, and coming uh, uh, you know, along with the results from, from New Horizons mission at Pluto, um, we're, we're just uh, really um, breaking through a frontier and understanding these um, very, uh, fascinating dwarf planets and the fact that they really are uh, present day um, little worlds. Okay, so let's get into it. How did we determine that Vesta is the parent body of the HEDs? Um, this plot that I'm showing here is showing those two band centers, the band one at one micron, the band two at two microns that we saw in that reflectance spectra earlier. And if you, um, analyze samples of the HED meteorites in the lab, uh, they show up as these dots and squares in different colors on the plots. And, and the basalts at one end and the diogenites at the other end, and the Howardites kind of span the, the space in between. Um, this cloud of gray points is what Veer found on the surface of Vesta. And it, it sits squarely in the field of the, the meteorite analyses. Um, it has some uh, deviation from that, but the takeaway is uh, that Vesta is clearly uh, consistent with being the parent body of the HEDs. And the other thing you, you should take away from this is that the, the surface is dominated by a Howarditic composition. So a mixture of eucrite and diogenite. So at the scale that the spectrometer was interrogating the surface, which was generally at about 100 meters or more, 
um, that was the um, th that was what the surface looked like it was made of. Now our gamma ray and neutron spectrometer, which measures elemental composition, so the individual elements of the minerals, can also um, determine whether Vesta is a match to the HEDs. And so here you're seeing iron silicon weight ratio versus an iron oxygen weight ratio. And all of the, again, all of the measurements from laboratory data. And um, let me just make it clear that these are not the only laboratory data. There's, there's many, many um, points, but this is a good representative, um, uh, good representative sample. Um, and in the, the two um, ellipses that you see here is the one sigma and two sigma uh, boundaries of the point cloud of uh, measurements that were made by the grand instrument, the gamma ray and neutron detector. And here again, you can see a very clear correspondence between the two. So um, we conclude from this that Vesta is a match to the HED and does represent the parent body. Now we also had gravity and shape data to interrogate the interior of the body. And those data are, um, they indicate the presence of a core. The gravity data um, indicates that there is a, a central mass condensation. Um, it, gravity data is, is non-unique. So we couldn't uh, necessarily say, is it um, a big core that's you know, less dense and rich in sulfur versus a very compact uh, iron nickel core? But we can use constraints from the HEDs, um, which are consistent with, a, um, with iron sinking into the center of the body because the iron is depleted in um, the other minerals that have uh, formed out of the liquids. So we can um, take some constraints from the HED meteorites that we have an iron rich um, central condensation. And then we can infer what the size of that is based on a density from those uh, meteoritic constraints. And from that, we get a, a, a radius of the core, which is on the order of you know, about 110 kilometers um, for a range of core densities, which span um, something that's uh, rather sulfur rich at 6,000 kilograms per meter cubed up to um, really a pure iron nickel core. And the, that radius is consistent with what was inferred from, uh, from the study of the geochemical models which would match the, uh, the HED meteorite constraints. So we, we got another clear um, indication of Vesta being consistent with um, the HED parent body. Now, um, geo revised geochemical modeling, which was done in incorporating these constraints, was able to pin down um, a, with a little more certainty what Vesta was made of. And so just uh, quickly, um, Michael Toplis did, uh, did modeling starting with 12 um, starting compositions, which were uh, consistent with uh, meteoritic compositions, and then looked at uh, where you would end up in terms of core radius and core density um, with these starting compositions and how it would uh, match the constraints from, from the dog mission shown by this, um, this shaded, uh, shaded gray region. And uh, the upshot is he was able to, uh, to, to rule out for, um, for various reasons, uh, all of these compositions except H chondrite. And, um, but the H chondrite was not quite um, sufficient to match what, uh, what the Vesta core size and core radius um, look like. So um, it, it is consistent with a mixture of about 75% H chondrite and a minor 25% CM chondrite component. So this is not, um, you know, saying definitively that that you know we had those two combinations in those in those fractions, but it gives you a uh, a, a good indication of what the bulk composition of the uh, accretionary feedstock was for Vesta. And then another important point was that um, it it that material also had to be. Um, volatile core. Um, it, it had lost hypervolatiles like sodium before uh, it accreted. And that would be consistent with Vesta forming uh, closer to the sun and more in the terrestrial planet region. And also uh, the thermal chemical modeling showed that Vesta formed very early 
um, within about 1.5 million years after CAIs. Okay, uh, we did know from telescopic data that uh, Vesta had a, um, a big chunk taken out of the Southern Hemisphere, thought to be the, uh, the impact that released all the material uh, to form the Vestoids, which is the, uh, the family of objects that orbits with Vesta. But what we found um, to our surprise was there was actually two uh, huge impacts at this, uh, in the Southern Hemisphere. And so Vesta uh, survived two planetary scale impacts, which excavated deep into its interior. Um, and this is really quite a surprise. And you can see these, um, these troughs around close to the equator, which are the um, effect of this later Rhea Silvia impact um, on um, a, a full body um, response to that impact. And we determined that Rhea Silvia, whose age is about 1 billion years old, is the likely source of the Vestoids and the HEDs. Um, surprisingly, no olivine was detected in the deep basins. And um, if you wanna know, well, what's so important about olivine, um, that's the mineral we expect would be um, making up the mantle of Vesta. So the basaltic crust forms from liquids which make their way um, from the surface after the interior melts, the iron's going to the, the center. And then we expect this, um, this mineral olivine, which is iron magnesium rich uh, mineral to constitute the bulk of the interior. But um, these impacts which excavated very, very deeply did not find uh, uh, significant olivine uh, outcrops. So what does that mean? Um, and that was a, you know, a very important uh, observation that was made by the mission. Now, prior to, to Don getting there, uh, based on the HEDs again, I mean, decades of, of research on these rocks has, has really uh, given us tremendous insight. The trace element chemistry of the Eucrites, so the, these um, more, more minor elements, argued against a, a well-mixed source, so a global magma ocean. And it raised the possibility that maybe Vesta wasn't the only source of the HEDs. Maybe there were, there were many Vesta type bodies. Um, and also uh, theoretical modeling of the um, volcanism on a small low gravity body like Vesta uh, predicted that there would be no magma ocean um, and there would be um, much more discrete um, pathways for melts to get to the surface. And so there would be a lot of heterogeneity in the crust. Um, now, more recently, models that included a, a late stage discrete magma sources, in addition to an early, earlier uh, more magma ocean phase or shallow magma ocean phase, um, would be sufficient to explain these geochemical variations. And that's um, illustrated by this, this figure from the Mandler and Elkins Tanton paper um, on, that's on the bottom here. So what did we find? Um, what, the distribution of eucrite and diagenite on the surface of Vesca, Vesta is quite heterogeneous. Now I mentioned that it's mostly Howarditic, but we see, um, we see concentrations of eucrite shown in blue uh, on the top. Uh, both of these plots have the same uh, color scale, basically uh, eucrite in blue, Howardite in red, uh, sorry, diagenite in red, and Howardite is, is the, uh, the middle colors. So what we see is a patch that's eucrite rich, um, we see that at the depth, the grand senses, which is a few uh, tens of centimeters below the surface, um, we see diagenite in the Southern hemisphere. Um, and then we also see a, um, a region in the Eastern hemisphere here where Veer, the infrared spectrometer sees patchy, uh, kind of a patchy distribution of diagenite. And Grand sees um, a, a much, um, a much higher uh, concentration of diagenetic howardite. So um, what does this mean? When you combine that distribution with the, the gravity anomalies, so the gravity anomalies are, are telling you about the, um, the density and the, the crustal thickness, um, you know, either or, the density or the crustal thickness, um, it's, it's telling us that we have higher density in the um, eastern region, coincident to where we see this, um, this more concentrated diagenetic uh, material. And so the interpretation that we've made is that these density variations are supporting an interpretation that there was a late stage in placement of plutons within the crust 
those plutons are the, the, uh, the, the mass of, of magma that's coming through the pre-existing crust um, as, a, as a melt product, and then um, either uh, freezing within the crust or possibly um, getting to the surface. Um, so what we, we found based on the distribution of the composition and the, the density, it supports the idea of this um, more complex uh, magmatic history in which you had uh, disc more discrete magma sources at the la last stage of volcanism or magnetism on the body. Now I'll turn to the hydrogen story. Um, this again shows the <clears throat> gamma ray neutron data on the top and the infrared data on the bottom. And that eucrite rich region that we were looking at, at the previous, on the previous slide shows also a, um, a high concentration of hydrogen. And um, Veer is sensitive to um, hydroxyl and um, the, the neutron detector is only telling us about hydrogen content, but, but we can see that they coincide. And so this appears to have come from impacting carbonaceous chondrites. And why do we think that? Because we can um, relate that, uh, that type of concentration of um, hydrox hydroxylated material to the class that we see in Howardites. So um, the dark material in this um, cross section of a Howardite that you see um, in the figure um, is at about the same percentage, um, if you added it up uh, across that, that region, as the hydrogen content that the neutron detector was, um, was seeing. So this, this carbonaceous material has water, but the water is bound in the minerals. Um, it's stable um, in those minerals. It's present on the surface of Vesta, and it likely came from impactors composed of, of this primitive hydrous material. So the important point here is that um, this is not just a, a, a you know a couple of uh, pieces coming from co coming in onto the surface of Vesta. We can see a large region of this volatile rich material, and it's also been concluded that it may have come from that uh, Venenea impact. Um, the impactor may have been this uh, hydrous rich material, which um, then the ejecta of which is is coating the surface of Vesta. And we see evidence of this dark and light material mixed up all through Vesta's regolith um, in these um, beautiful uh, patterns that we're able to see both in the, um, the albedo variations as well as in the, the colors that are measured by our, our, our camera with, with its seven color filters. And so we can see the geology of Vesta is also quite complex, which was a little bit um, uh, unexpected for such a small body. Um, here we can also see at the uh, rim of Marcia crater, the dark uh, layer that's uh, cropping out on the crater wall and that very bright layer at the surface. Um, and this crater is, is really fascinating because it has many interesting features. So we're going to take a little tour. So take a deep breath, fly around the crater. We're going to see how its morphology is, is variable as you go around. It's, it's really not that round, um, and that's typical of a lot of craters on Vesta. We see a very smooth sheet of material that's just coming from the lower left. And then in the, in the bottom of the crater, there's this really interesting terrain, and it's full of pits. And these pits um, are in this, this um, fairly uh, fine grain material, and you can see the distribution here. And basically, they're uh, consistent with, with gases coming to the surface, and you know the bubble breaks, and then you get uh, a pit. It's a, basically a rim that, rimless depression. And they decrease away from this kind of central source. So uh, they, they're very analogous to similar types of, uh, of morphology seen on Mars and interpreted to be due to this volatile release. So here we have evidence for um, hyd hydrogen rich materials sitting on the surface of Vesta. And now we have in, uh, evidence of volatiles in the subsurface that are being exhumed by impacts. That was really quite a surprise. But it's not just on Marcha Crater. We also see that um, in, in other craters that are young 
like Cornelia, where again, you can see um, in, the, in the bottom of this crater, another one of these pitted terrains. And those pitted terrains occur also um, in craters that have these, um, these different kind of gullies, these um, sinuous merging channels that are coming down the crater walls into the, the bottom where the pits are. And, and they're in contrast to other craters which have just these uh, straight um, linear gullies which are consistent with mass wasting of dry granular material. So the interpretation here is that where we see these sinuous gullies and the pits, um, this could be consistent with water flowing for a short period of time. Um, this is one um, scenario and trying to explain how you would get water on Vesta, the, one of the driest bodies in the solar system due to its differentiation and melting previously, is that if you brought uh, an, if an incoming impact or brought ice rich material, um, it could be sequestered in the subsurface, covered up by the ejecta and therefore um, become stable over geologic time. Um, then a, a net, another impact comes and basically exhumes that material, um, melts the ice, the ice um, flows transiently uh, down the crater walls and um, for, can form a reservoir at, at the bottom of the crater, which then is, is being um, covered up with the ejecta, but um, the, that material, that volatile material is able to escape and form these pits. So um, if, if this scenario actually did take place, then it, it's an indication that even on very dry bodies that we could have um, some ice in the subsurface and also that, um, that significant amount of water was delivered to the inner solar system from water rich impactors and those would be bodies like Ceres. So that's a good segue to talk about Ceres. Um, and I better hurry up. <laughs> so let's go quickly through the major findings and then get to uh, the fun stuff. Um, we already mentioned it formed with abundant volatile material, the presence of ammoniated material that we found on all over the surface indicates it formed in an outer solar system environment because, uh, because ammonia is not stable um, where Ceres currently resides. So it had to come from somewhere else. Uh, global alteration in the water rich interior would have kept the interior cool and that preserved the volatiles within Ceres. Uh, we only found evidence of organics at one location, but this may be because of um, surface mixing and obscuration by space weathering or, um, or radiation. Uh, and we do know that the surface of Ceres is really carbon rich. Um, so Ceres is representative of a class of large volatile rich bodies that bear many similarities to icy moons. So here's a quick cartoon to go through Ceres um, evolution. It starts out with water ice, carbon dioxide, ammonia hydrates, and silicates. It heats up, the ice melts, and this slurry of, of um, muddy material starts to convect. A global ocean forms. The, um, the interior then uh, grows as a, uh, a core of possibly dehydrated silicates remains in the center. Um, hydrated silicates form the, the outer core, possibly the entire core. Um, and this brine rich layer uh, is, exists for some period of time while the, um, and, and it's melting from the outside in. So we get a primitive ice shell. The ice is rejecting the salts as it's um, freezing. And so this layer becomes very brine rich as the freezing proceeds. And then finally, um, we have uh, maybe what we're seeing at the present day, which is a mixed ice rock salt hydrate crust, uh, which we infer has a significant uh, clathrate component. Um, the clathrate component is essentially, it's, it's a gas molecule in a water cage and it makes ice very strong. So uh, the crust of Ceres is actually quite strong and that's why it can um, support 
crater topography over geologic time, which would be um, difficult to do if it was just uh, a very pure icy shell. Um, and so we, we can see from impacts, we can probe the, uh, the, the strength of the crust. We also um, see evidence for hydrothermal activity. And so uh, we're, we're going to uh, delve into that in more detail. So uh, the, the takeaways here, the residue and the brine separate and the surface and bulk elemental composition will differ. Okay, so this is what we infer the interior of Ceres to look like uh, very simplistically, about a 40 kilometer thick strong crust. We get that from analysis of gravity and topography. I already mentioned what it's made up of, but importantly, uh, we infer it has no more than 30% ice. And below this strong layer is a denser rocky mantle um, of hydrated silicates. It's, it's not, nowhere near the um, silicate density at 2460. Um, but in between, there is a, um, a weak layer in the mantle where the, we infer the pore space is filled with residual brine. So here is where you're getting, um, you're getting far enough down uh, from, this, from the um, cold surface that the, um, the brines can be, in, uh, it can exist, liquids will be, um, can exist. And that is uh, forming, basically it's, it's allowing the global shape of Ceres to relax into uh, more of a hydrostatic shape. Now we also um, discovered, which was a, a major discovery that there's sodium carbonate on the surface um, and it's erupting in, um, this particular crater Akator, which we're going to hear more about. Um, and this is the largest, um, or the one of the uh, three areas of the solar system where we've found sodium carbonate. We have plenty of it on Earth at hydrothermal lakes and um, those kinds of environments. And it's coming out of the plumes of Enceladus. So it's, um, it's an indication of these aqueous alteration processes that I mentioned before. Um, and so it's, it's a, a, a very important marker of uh, potential uh, habitable environment in the past and evidence for this uh, global subsurface ocean. Um, the, also the distribution of the clays on the surface um, being so homogeneous is, is further evidence or prime evidence that this um, alteration was global um, and pervasive um, throughout the body. Um, I mentioned also that organics were found only in one place on the surface in abundance, but that we that may not be an indication that they don't exist elsewhere. So putting um, th these observations together, um, the presence of the ammoniated material indicates Ceres must have formed uh, farther on the solar system. So um, we can ask, where did it form? Um, was it in the trans-Neptunian disk? and then implanted into the main belt. Um, we, we think that we can discard that hypothesis because it's been shown that it's very dynamically difficult um, to, to move Ceres from that region. And then um, Ceres does not resemble TNOs or KBOs. The trans-Neptunian objects are Kuiper belt objects. Um, it may have formed closer to its present position by accreting material that just drifted inwards, these pebbles um, that were nitrogen uh, ammonia rich uh, pebbles. Um, that's also difficult to do uh, because Jupiter started to form very early and opened a gap in the nebula, which would have prevented this material from um, crossing. So the, the simplest explanation is that Ceres formed in the giant planet region and then was scattered inward um, as the giant planets continued to grow. And this is, this emerging paradigm is consistent with cosmic chemical models. So this is um, our favorite hypothesis. So what is Ceres surface telling us? Um, I did mention ongoing geologic activity. Um, we see variations in colors on the surface, which are telling us about um, the differences in the uh, composition, the mineralogy. Um, and if you look at this, um, this color map made from the framing camera, the, the bluish brightest areas um, are rich in sodium carbonate. The reddish, reddish areas are um, associated with organics. And then you can see we have lots of different types of materials. So let's focus on uh, the evidence for brine-driven geology. 
Um, we found a singular mountain on Ceres Ahuna Mons, four kilometers high, about 20 kilometers um, in, in um, diameter. And it's um, got a very youthful appearance um, that indicates that it formed in a, as a construction of material squeezed up from the subsurface. And the surface um, surfaces of the mountain are, uh, are showing a high concentration of sodium carbonate. So we inferred that Ahunamans is the result of uh, subsurface brines being forced up to the surface and then erupting to form this, this, um, this sort of volcanic uh, construct. And it's, uh, there are many settings where we find the sodium carbonate and, um, and other salts. So it's suggesting that there's a significant near surface abundance of these materials. Now the other place, the sort of poster child for marine driven activity is Akatur Crater, as I mentioned before. And here we see uh, very youthful bright deposits um, in the center of the crater called Seralia facula. Facula means bright spot. And Vinalia facula um, over on, on the crater floor. So in the final phase of the mission, which we call XM2 for extended mission two, um, we focused on getting closer to Akatur Crater to really find out more about um, the emplacement of those materials and the nature of this um, brine-driven geologic activity. So we, um, we put the spacecraft into a low paracenter um, eccentric orbit. The paracenter was 35 kilometers, and we were in this orbit from uh, about June through the end of the mission, uh, the end of October. And we revealed the surface of this crater in amazing resolution and found it was just a even more fantastically interesting than we imagined it would be. So um, here, uh, the, the first image here is just the central Seralia facula um, showing its, uh, its beautiful distribution of the bright material. We see um, a lot of fractures on the surface, kind of radial fractures. Um, for this from this dome that is um, this uplifted in the center. Uh, on the walls of the crater, we see lots of outcrops of this bright material and a lot of mass wasting. Um, we see uh, more indications of competent material towards the surface and, and a lot of mass wasting down the slopes. Um, many, many fractures in the crater floor. And this uh, interesting bench type feature um, which you see also in the central uh, figure, where we've got the bright material sitting up on top of a, um, a mass heap on the side of the, of the central depression. Now over at the Vinalia facula, we have much more diffuse deposits of the bright material. They seem to be associated with fractures. They seem to be uh, more in place like snow from a ballistic fountaining uh, type of eruption. And there are a lot of complicated relationships between the bright and dark material. Now, the, the picture I just put up has a very dark um, spot in the center, and that's a recent impact. So the most recent impact is, has exposed the darkest material in this area. And then you can see that we have what looks like some sort of a, um, a kind of a center of activity surrounded by, um, by an interesting pattern of the bright material. And then focusing in on this little area here, we see bright material at the edge of a fracture that seems to be um, dripping down the wall into the fracture. So this would indicate that the fracture was, um, was active after the bright material was in place. Now, um, so another little movie, and then we'll wrap up um, a little tour of the crater. And what you're seeing is now we're painting the high resolution data from the XM2 phase on top of the uh, pre-existing uh, data from the, uh, the primary mission. And you can see how the details are coming out um, in this high resolution data, which are really giving us uh, tremendous insights about the processes that by which this material was in place and, and what it um, is telling us about the, uh, the timing and the, uh, the nature of the, of the brine activity on the surface. 
So now it's going to, uh, we're going to get contrast to see where the brightest material is. And you can see that deposit on top of the massif that I told you about. Um, and so you can see that there are lots of bright little spots, probably from small impacts. Um, and then again, the overall um, contrast and brightness between that bright material and the, the uh, sort of background series material, which is very dark. So uh, quickly, what we found from the XM2 results, which are all um, have been recently published in a series of papers in Nature, Communications, Astronomy, and Geosciences, is that the crater floor is covered in a water-rich impact melt sheet that was um, created as um, soon as the uh, impact occurred. And this, this um, melt actually sloshed around and covered terraces that were forming as the, um, as the crater walls were um, were evolving. We also see in this um, view that there are lots of mounds um, in the crater floor and pingo type features, which look like ice cored um, uh, features that are where the ice is pushing up from the subsurface. Then uh, this fantastic view created at Max Planck showing uh, a close up of Soralia Tholus in the center of the Soralia Facula. Um, this crater is about 20 million years old, but the age of the Soralia Tholus from crater uh, age date, crater counting age dating, is less than 2 million years old. And that indicates that this brine activity has been persistent over time. And furthermore, we, um, the Beer instrument found hydrated sodium not carbonate, hydrated sodium chloride, really apologize for that. Hydrated sodium chloride was detected by Beer on Soralia tholus. And that also is indicating very recent emplacement because uh, sodium hydrohalide sodium chloride hydrated form is very unstable and would be um, destabilized within probably 100 years or so. So what we see, um, from putting together all of the, the details from the geologic mapping and the inferences from the distribution of the, the erupted brines is that um, it appears that we have at least two sources of these brines because the timing of the, um, the, the eruptions being taking so long and the fact that um, the impact induced heat would not stick around that long to, to be driving these uh, eruptions. So um, that combined with the fracture history and the, and the distribution material um, provides this insight into what might be going on. But we can take a closer look by um, looking uh, into the subsurface with the gravity data and also by um, using thermal modeling to understand how long that impact melt chamber would survive. So in my last two slides, I'll summarize this. Um, the, on the, the right, you're seeing four time steps of a thermal evolution model, where at the, the top uh, left, you're seeing uh, at the time of the impact, where you can see impactor material in those bright uh, orange colors um, encased in a uh, impact melt chamber um, inside the, the solid, uh, black line, which indicates the water ice melting uh, eutectic. We have sodium carbonate in the, uh, in, in the white line, and then we have ammonium chloride in the dashed black line. So um, as we go through the time steps, at 1 million years, 5 million years, and 10 million years, you can see that the impact melt chamber um, it shrinks considerably. And by 10 million years, it, it, it's, it's really over. Um, and, and sodium carbonate has, has frozen out by that time. But um, importantly for, um, for this model is it shows us that the ammonium chloride rich brine will, was there to begin with at about 35 kilometers depth and persists um, with, with some enhancement under the crater um, after about 10 million years. So uh, could this material be the source of the persistent activity? So we looked also um, investigated the source of isostatic gravity anomalies. So um, indicating that there was low dense material, low density material um, under the region in which the crater was located. 
And furthermore, there seems to be a more discrete source of or area of low density material just adjacent to the crater. And so these, these two cross sections on the bottom are showing you uh, a, a high likelihood model from uh, a gravity inversion um, with a, you know, showing you have a very broad area of low density, which we interpret could be uh, an area that's enhanced in brines and also a discrete source adjacent to the crater, which could be feeding um, through fractures, uh, eruptions, both in the crater, but also um, some, some of these uh, domes that we see outside of the crater. Um, so in these uh, evolutionary plots, you see the impact melt chamber um, uh, decreasing in size and descending uh, away from the surface while the um, activity is continuing along these fractures. And so that brings us to um, the, the final stage um, shown now on the right where we think the ongoing activity is, is being sourced directly from these deep brines um, and the melt chamber has, has largely frozen out. Um, and this is consistent with uh, the, the presence of hydrohalite um, at the surface uh, at Soralia Tholis. So uh, the conclusion is this brine activity is resulting from a combination of impact induced uh, melts and the mobilization of these deep brines and as such, um, it, it is both a, um, the it presents the possibility that impacts could create transient habitable niches on, um, on icy bodies and that impact induced brine activity could be important on icy moons as well. So um, the takeaways, best end series form closely in time, but their paths diverge largely as a result of initial composition. Um, Vesta formed from volatile pleated material and its volatiles were delivered later by impacts. Ceres incorporated abundant ammonia, likely ammonia hydrate, indicating it formed beyond 5 AU and migrated to its current neighborhood. We think in the giant planet region is the most likely formation uh, location. Um, Ceres ongoing geologic activity and subsurface brines, it's ancient subsurface ocean, suggests that habitable environments um, existed within the dwarf planet and could exist um, for similar types of objects. And so Ceres affinity to large main belt objects, icy moons provide us new constraints on the origin and evolution of these bodies. And then I'll just um, leave up these takeaways of, of in general that um, small worlds in our solar system are um, incredibly useful because they bore witness to many of the processes that shape the planetary neighborhood, um, evolutionary processes, dynamic scattering, the gradients in disk chemistry, and that has important implications for distribution of water and creation of habitable environments. So looking forward to uh, future small body exploration and sample return so that we can continue to learn more. Thank you so much for your attention. And I hope I can answer a few questions. Um, sorry for taking too much time. Thank you very much, Carol. So if Saliba allows me to put my video back on, I, I do that, but he doesn't. Anyway, so thank you very much for that great talk. Uh, uh, for uh, about a mission that your predecessor, Chris Russell, you know, said it was, in his view, the most cost-effective planetary mission uh, to date. <laughs> uh, you know, we, we, have, we have actually two, uh, you know, um, possibilities uh, to ask questions. You know, you can put your question as always in the chat channel uh, or, uh, and then I will read it uh, to Carl and everybody else, or you can raise your hand and then Saliba will be watching, you know, the list um, uh, will be uh, turning the mic to you. I have already one question in the chat channel by Vera Aziz Fernandez, uh, who after congratulating uh, you for this talk asked the question, Having such a distinct prime signature, it should be relatively easy to distinguish material from Ceres in the meteorite collection. Are there any suspects? If not, what may be the reason for it? Yeah. Um, so there are no meteorites that look like Ceres. Um, I, I should have mentioned that. Um, and so this didn't you know, knowing the detailed mineralogy or composition of series did not help us to make those connections. 
Um, it's been <clears throat> hypothesized that the material that would be um, excavated from Ceres would be just too fragile. And you know, being being water rich, um, it's the the volatiles are sublimating, um, and and maybe this material is is more akin to interplanetary dust because it's it's just not comp not not um, strong enough to to make it to Earth, and certainly not to make it through the Earth's atmosphere. Okay, John Rummel asks, what signs did you miss by having the magnetometer left off the mission? Now that has an interesting story <laughs> story in the background, I think. But yeah. you're more qualified to answer that. <laughs> um, so you know, we actually put the magnetometer on to to, to see if Vesta uh, had if Vesta's crust was magnetized, because we think Vesta likely had a dynamo early in its history. Um, so it had a little magnetic field, and as the crust was cooling it should have recorded that field. And so we wanted to, um, to confirm that because there are um, magnetized meteorites from Vesta. And interestingly, we're now, um, we're now learning that maybe the nebular magnetic field was strong enough that, um, that early forming bodies could have been magnetized just by, their, um, by the nebular field rather than um, their own dynamos. So, so this is really active area of research. And it would have been great to understand um, how strongly Vesta's crust <clears throat> was magnetized. And, and if it had geologic, uh, if, if the pattern made geologic sense, for instance. Um, so that's why we put the magnetometer on. But, it, but of course, as the mission was, was proceeding in its implementation phase, uh, the modeling of Ceres was, was getting much better and we had some more telescopic data and it became clear that Ceres probably, um, you know, could, could have had a uh, subsurface ocean in the past. It, it could possibly have um, some, some brines in the present. And so then the magnetometer became much more important uh, for Ceres as well. So um, it would have been nice to, to try to, um, to, to measure any, uh, interaction between uh, Brian's in Ceres and the solar wind. We did get an indication from, um, from the gamma ray uh, neutron detector of a, um, the, that Ceres um, did present a, an obstacle to the solar wind. Uh, a bow shock was created um, when, uh, when that solar wind was um, at a particularly energetic uh, period. So um, we, we think that there was uh, somewhat of a transient atmosphere that was created by sputtering of the surface or just by, by, some, by some amount of um, um, material in the atmosphere. So that's not indication of uh, brines in the subsurface, but it is indication of uh, an uh, interaction with the solar wind, which can uh, cr change the magnetic environment around the body. Um, so, this demands a follow-up. I think um, you know people are interested in, in going to Vesta with a magnetometer and, and also to do other things, but importantly, um, to go to Ceres now that we uh, have inferred that there are brines uh, you know, at these depths of the subsurface and go test that hypothesis by doing um, some sort of a sounding experiment. So it's not, um, you know, not just the magnetometer, but actually doing, doing a sounding, magnetic sounding. Yeah, it's actually too bad that, you know, PIs coming from the magnetometer community had to de-scope a magnetometer from the mission. That was, that was too bad. There's yeah. another question by Ilan Roth, I think. Uh, can we definitely conclude that some of the meteorites are the products of impacts on Vesta? Um, yeah, there's, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of evidence that I'll try to summarize quickly. Um, so we do see ages of meteorites, like the, there's, there's a, a, a spike in potassium argon ages uh, for um, lunar rocks and um, HEDs at about, let's just call it like 4, million year, 4 billion years ago. Um, that is not the, the time when these we think these, these rocks were excavated from Vesta. And the reason is a really important piece of information is the fact that Vesta's dynamical family, the Vestoids, um, are 
clustered at the, in the present um, in a manner that says they couldn't have been uh, released from the surface of Vesta more than a billion years ago. Otherwise, you know, these, these small forces would have caused them to drift apart and, you know, we wouldn't see this tight clustering that we're seeing today. So, so we know that most of the HEDs probably got excavated in the Rhea Silvia impact, but the Rhea Silvia impact was not the um, event which reset their potassium argon ages. So it could be that this, this one, two that we're seeing in the Southern hemisphere, um, the, maybe the ben Beninea impact was the one that reset the ages and the rocks we're seeing now um, came dominantly from that Rhea Silvia impact. Okay, uh, Car, well, no, Siri uh, just says, excellent talk, thank you very much, but not a question with that. I have a question, actually. I mean, I, I was interested to see your uh, conclusion that Ceres would come from beyond Jupiter, but not beyond Saturn, okay? And uh, I was wondering if that has any implications, you know, for uh, formation models of uh, the solar system, you know, where the planets are shoveled around, like the Grand Tag or the Venice model. Could you comment on this? Uh, yeah, well, I, um, I can't comment uh, any more than to say um, it's consistent with that. Okay. Uh, it's more consistent with that Ceres would come from the giant planet region than, than it would come from the trans-Neptunian region. And I, I, I think the argument is that if um, it, it's, as I said, dynamically difficult to get Ceres from um, that, you know, very distant region to its current orbit um, without bringing a whole lot of other things. You know, we, we would expect to see um, other objects that, that had affinity to, to trans-Neptunian objects uh, in, the, in the current belt. Um, so it's, it's, it's a, that, that's an argument against it coming from that region. Um, and instead, it's, it, you know, it's um, composition or what we can infer of its starting composition um, is consistent with it forming in that region and it's much less dynamically difficult to get it into its current orbit. Okay, we have a few more congratulations, but ah, here's another question. Only Ceres formed between the orbits of the giant planets is the question. That's probably the follow up on my question. No, I, I think that, um, well, I think there's uh, growing uh, evidence that um, many C type bodies would have formed in this region. So this could be the, um, could have been the formation region for uh, many objects in the main belt. And the, you know, the, the question is which ones and um, can we test the hy that, that hypothesis by either by through more studies of the meteorite record or, or actually going and visiting these bodies. Okay, it seems we have exhausted all the, the questions in the chat channel, if I'm not mistaken, and we do not have any raised hands. So uh, we can thank you very much again uh, and um, uh, adjourn. Uh, I just wanted to point out that this talk will be on our web uh, uh, page, you know, if you want to. Uh, revisit it and uh, you know, like all the other talks in, in the seminar series so far. Uh, and next Thursday, we will have a talk on magnetic fields in the vicinity of the Earth and uh, reconnection phenomena and so forth uh, there. So, see you again next week. And thank you very much, Carol, for this very interesting and fascinating talk. And um, see you next time. Bye bye. Have a good day. Thank you very much for inviting me. Take care. Thank you.